The Secret Garden, Chapter 4, Part 3. Perhaps it was because she had nothing whatsoever to do that she thought so much of the deserted garden. She was curious about it and wanted to see what it was like. Why had Mr Archibald Craven buried the key if he had liked his wife so much? Why did he hate her garden? She wondered if she should ever see him, but she knew that if she did, she should not like him and he would not like her and that she should only stand and stare at him and say nothing, though she should be wanting dreadfully to ask him why he had done such a queer thing. People never like me, and I never like people, she thought, and I never can talk as the Crawford children could. They were always talking and laughing and making noise. She thought of the robin, and of the way he seemed to sing his song at her, and as she remembered the tree top he perched on, she stopped rather suddenly on the path, I believe that tree was in the secret garden. I feel sure it was, she said. There was a wall round the place and there was no door. She walked back into the first garden she had entered and found the old man digging there. She went and stood beside him and watched him a few moments in her cold little way. He took no notice of her and so at last she spoke to him. I have been into the other gardens, she said. There was nothing to prevent thee, he answered crustily. I went into the orchard. There was no dog at the door to bite thee, he answered. There was no door there into the other garden, said Mary. What garden? he said in a rough voice, stopping his digging for a moment. The one on the other side of the wall, answered Mistress Mary. There were trees there. I saw the tops of them. A bird with a red breast was sitting in one of them and he sang. To her surprise, the surely old weather-beaten face actually changed its expression. A slow smile spread over it, and the gardener looked quite different. It made her think that it was a curious how much nicer a person looked when he smiled. She had not thought of it before. He turned about to the orchard side of his garden and began to whistle. A low, soft whistle. She could not understand how such a surely man could make such a coaxing sound. Almost the next moment, a wonderful thing happened. She heard a soft little rushing flight through the air and it was the bird with the red breast flying to them, and he actually alighted on a, the big clod of earth quite near to the gardener's foot. Here he is, chuckled the old man, and then he spoke to the bird as if he were speaking to a child. Where hast thou been, thou cheeky little beggar, he said. I have not seen thee before today. Has thou begun thou courting this early in the season? Thou art too forward. The bird put his tiny head on one side and looked at him with his soft bright eyes, which was like a black dewdrop. He seemed quite familiar and not the least afraid. He hopped about and pecked the earth briskly, looking for seeds and insects. It actually gave Mary a queer feeling in her heart, because he was so pretty and cheerful and seemed so like a person. He had a tiny plump body and a delicate beak and slender delicate legs. Will he always come when you call him? She asked, almost in a whisper. Aye, that he will. I've known him ever since he was a fledging. He come out of the nest in the other garden, and when he first struck over the wall, he was too weak to fly back for a few days, and we got friendly. When he went over the wall again, the rest of the brood were gone, and he was lonely, and he came back to me. What kind of bird is he? Mary asked. Doesn't now know? He's a robin redbreast, and they're the friendliest curious as to birds alive. They're almost as friendly as dogs. And if you know how to get on with them, watch him pecking about there and looking round at us now and again. He knows we're talking about him. It was the queerest thing in the world to see the old fellow. He looked at the plump little scarlet waistcoated bird as if he were both proud and fond of him. He's a conceited one, he chuckled. He likes to hear folks talk about him and curious, bless me, there never was his luck for curiosity in meddling. He's always coming to see what I'm planting. He knows all the things Mr Craven never troubles himself to find out. He's the head gardener, he is. The robin hopped about, busily pecking the soil, and now and then stopped and looked at them a little. Mary thought his black dewdrop eyes gazed at her with the greatest curiosity. It really seemed as if he were finding out all about her. The queer feeling in her heart increased. Where did the rest of the brood fly to? She asked. There's no knowing. The old ones turn them out of the nest and make them fly, and they're scattered before you know it. 
This one was knowing. Bonnie knew he was lonely. Mistress Mary went a step nearer to the robin and looked at him very hard. I'm lonely, she said. She had not known before that this was one of the things which, that this was one of the things which made her feel sour and cross. She seemed to find it out when the robin looked at her, and she looked at the robin. The old gardener pushed his cap back on his bald head and stared at her a minute. Art thou the little wench from India? he asked. Mary nodded. Then no wonder thou art lonely. That'll be lonely before thou's done, he said. He began to dig again, driving his spade deep into the rich black garden soil, while the robin hopped about, very busily employed. What is your name? Mary inquired. He stood up to answer her. Ben Weatherstaff, he answered. And then he added with a surely chuckle, I'm lonely myself, except when he's with me. And he jerked his thumb towards the robin. He's the only friend I've got. I have no friends at all, said Mary. I never had. My eye didn't like me. I never played. I'd never played with anyone. It is a Yorkshire habit to say what you think with blunt frankness. And old Ben Weatherstaff was a Yorkshire Moor man. Thou and me are a good bit alike, he said. We was wove out the same cloth. We're neither of us good looking, and we're both of us as sour as we look. We've got the same nasty tempers, both of us, I'll warrant. This was plain speaking, and Mary Lennox had never heard the truth about herself in her life. Native servants always slummed and submitted to you, whatever you did. She had never thought much about her looks, but she wondered if she was unattractive as Ben Weatherstaff, and she also wondered if she looked as sour as he had looked before the robin came. She actually began to wonder also if she was nasty tempered. She felt uncomfortable. Suddenly, a clear rippling little sound broke out near her and she turned around. She was standing a few feet from a young apple tree and the robin had flown on one of its branches and had burst out into a scrap of a song. Ben Weatherstaff laughed outright. What did he do for that? asked Mary. He made up his mind to make friends with thee, replied Ben. Dang me if he hasn't took a fancy to thee. To me, said Mary. She moved towards the little tree softly and looked up. Would you make friends with me? She said to the robin, just as if she were speaking to a person. Would you? And she did not say it in either her hard little voice or her imperious Indian voice, but in a tone so soft and eager and coaxing that Ben Weatherstaff was as surprised as she had been when she heard him whistle. Why, he cried out. Thou said that as nice as a human, as if thou was a real child instead of a sharp old woman. Thou said it almost like Dickens talks to his wild things on the moor. Do you know Dickens? Mary asked, turning round rather in a hurry. Everybody knows him. Dickens wandering about everywhere. Ray Blackberries and Heather Bells knows him. I warrant the foxes show him where their cub lie, and the skylark don't hide their nest from him. Mary would have liked to ask some more questions. She was almost as curious about Dickon as she was about the deserted garden. But just at that moment, the robin, who had ended his song, gave a little shake of his wings and spread them and flew away. He had made his visit and had other things to do. He has flown over the wall, Mary cried out, watching him. He has flown into the orchard and has flown across the other wall into the garden where there is no door. He lives there, said old Ben. He came out of the neck there. If he's caught in, he's making up to some young madam of a robin that lives amongst the old rose trees there. Rose trees, said Mary. Are there rose trees? Ben Weatherstaff took up his spade again and began to dig. There was, ten years ago, he mumbled. I should like to see them, said Mary. Where is the green door? There must be a door somewhere. Ben drove his spade deep and looked as unaccom unaccompaniable as he had looked when she first saw him. There was ten years ago, but there isn't now, he said. No door, cried Mary. There must be. None as anyone could find, and none as is anyone's business. Don't be a meddlesome wench and poke your nose where it's no cause to go. Here, I must go on with my work. Get you gone and play you. I've no more time. He actually stopped digging, threw his spade over his shoulder and walked off, without even glancing at her or saying goodbye. That is the end of chapter four, guys. I hope you enjoyed it.